Welcome everybody, Professor Steve here. And uh, we're going to round off this unit by just essentially touching on what really is only one other example or, or two other examples of, of biogeochemical cycling and the interconnectivity of all different cycles and, 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 how, um, and how these things affect each other. Um, but even just by touching on this one or two examples, um, it'll give you a feel for just how complex it is and how many other things are actually interconnected with when, when you just examine one element or two elements. <coughs> um, and so here's the by now familiar uh, essentially sch schematic model of what biogeochemical cycling does. Um, and so within these elemental transformations, this element going from maybe just it itself, um, just the element itself, to a compound, to a different another compound, whether it's organic or inorganic, or back and forth, and m mediated by these things, we have examined things for the most part one one element at a time, and now we've 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 just in this unit have started adding um, how many other things can affect this this element's biogeochemical cycling, or how this element's biogeochemical cycling can affect all the, the other things around it that that are whether it's because it's part of a compound or because it's part of a process that affects another compound um, and another another element that we've touched on a few times is is the global nitrogen cycle um, and really we've just talked about it, it with respect to being a nutrient um, that's necessary for many of the processes that we've talked about in the carbon cycle but really it's very integral intric integral in in its own set of of very specific carbon cycling um, but even even when we're talking about the nitrogen itself and its and its biogeochemical cycle and the complexity behind nitrogen is um, is that it's completely biologically mediated. Uh, so it, N2 exists in the atmosphere, is one of the, is the most abundant gas in the atmosphere, um, but essentially is biologically unavailable to anything. It has very little effect on, uh, it has no effect as a greenhouse gas, it has um, very little use except for in our breathing, our respiration, but um, the, in, its, in, in its diatomic form it's un, unavailable to us. But it spends most of its life cycling through all these different forms of nitrogen that are available to us and it's almost entirely mediated by microbes so in order for nitrogen dinitrogen to become start becoming available to all, to all other organisms it becomes available as dinitrogen to the only type of organisms that can use that and that's nitrogen fixing bacteria so through nitrogen fixation it, it now Give, becomes an organic form that can be consumed and created into another inorganic form and several other inorganic forms in this entirely microbial modulated um, cycling um, and then and it's once it's taken up by a by a um, by a primary producer that can then be eaten by a heterotroph is the only way for us to get our nitrogen and of course we have the same cycle in the in in the ocean or similar cycle different organisms we have you know uh, cyanobacteria do it in the in the ocean bacteria mostly associated with roots of plants do it in, in terrestrial um, and of course we have the same kind of interconnectivity as we do with carbon but since it's organisms that are growing and dying and consuming each other to change this nitrogen it's intricately linked with the carbon cycle that we've talked in much more detail about, right? So without this nitrogen cycle, we don't get most of this carbon cycle. Um, and without the carbon cycle, we don't get most of the nitrogen cycle. And now because climate um, is so dependent on certain forms and certain parts of the carbon cycle, um, the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle are intricately um, are intricately or inextricably linked to um, uh, to to climate to global climate and because parts of the cli uh, 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 certain climactic phenomena um, and most bio and all biological phenomena are linked to water the water cycle is also linked to the carbon cycle linked to the nitrogen cycle linked to the cl linked to climate and we can just keep doing this on and on and on so what other 
in in certain parts of the carbon cycle or certain parts of the nitrogen cycle what other elements are we touching and and what is that elements bio, biogeochemical cycle and 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 what other what other physical <coughs> physical or chemical cycles is that affecting you know does it trickle all the way back to climate is it directly linked to the water cycle and most things most things are linked to the carbon and the water water cycles so as a case study, we're going to view a very particular part of the carbon cycle that we haven't given much thought so, uh, so far. Um, <clears throat> and it's sort of heavy on, on chemistry if you look at it too closely. Um, but, but we do have to take a brief look at this just to, just to sort of delve into um, um, the complexity of it all. So we've talked uh, to great lengths about CO2 gas from the atmosphere uh, fl its flux in and out of the surface ocean, so it can diffuse in and be taken up by primary producers, or where it can be respired and diffuse out in some places. But it doesn't just diffuse in as CO2 gas and get taken directly up by a phytoplankton. That's not that's not its life story. Um, there's an intricate chemistry that happens with that diffusion into the ocean water, and we call it carbonate chemistry. So there are lots of other elements in the in the ocean floating around, but one of the most abundant elements on Earth is hydrogen. And as soon as CO2 gas diffuses into um, you know in the in the atmosphere, the oxygen can form with with hydrogen to make water. And when CO2 gas for it goes into the ocean or get comes in contact with water, um, it can interact with the hydrogens, and this has a very specific chemistry. Um, now you can think of chemical formulas as 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 having a balance. You know, um, if you add, you know, on, on one on one side of a chemical formula is is um, the reactants, so the the, the 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 ingredients needed to make a certain product, and on the other side of a formula is the product. Um, so whether we're looking at just this specific reaction here, this reaction here this reaction here or the reactions or this whole reaction it's if you add more of the reactants or the ingredients you get more of the product on this end okay and if you add more of the reactants or the ingredients on this end you drive the equation this way you drive the chemistry this way and you get more products on this end so you can think of as CO2 more and more CO2 diffuses into the ocean we're adding more and more there sure, sure is plenty of water here right in the ocean, so the more CO2 we add, the more reactants or ingredients we have on this side of the of the um, of the chemical equation, driving the reaction this way. So you can picture that teetering the other way, and so we end up with more of the products. Okay, so the majority of CO2 as it enters um, bonds with hydrogens and becomes what we call bicarbonate. Bicarbonate um, is is um, very stable and in, and is is sort of what's broken apart and actually is what is what actually is taken up by the phytoplankton, even though we talk about it in terms of of carbon dioxide mostly. Now, this is its sort of stable component, and this is acts as a very good buffer in the ocean, um, because what happens if you start breaking this molecule apart? In order to break this down from bicarbonate to carbonic acid to carbonate. Um, you have to start releasing some of these hydrogens, and every time you release one of these hydrogens, um, um, a hydrogen ion is associated with an increase in, I'm sorry, a decrease in pH, so an increase in the acidity, okay, and that's what makes carbonic acid, um, you know, so acidic, is that it, it, it very easily dissociates with its hydrogen ions, and these hydrogen ions decrease the acidity. So, if we are adding CO2 to the atmosphere, extra CO2 to the atmosphere, um, we are in fact increasing the amount of CO2 that can in equilibrium diffuse into the surface ocean and, er, and the more we do that, the more of these bicarbonate ions that are in the ocean get dissociated into carbonic acid and, and a hydrogen ion and then, and then those carbonic acid uh, molecules get dissociated even further to carbonate and and another hydrogen ion. So the more hydrogen ions we release, the more acidic the ocean comes. And this is indeed what we call ocean acidification, and it is it is happening very slowly. <clears throat>
in the ocean. We do have long-term measurements showing that the ocean is becoming more and more acidic. So for the, for the time being, it's not shifting very quickly because there's so much bicarbonate in the ocean. This acts as a buffer. Okay, so this is one just piece of the puzzle. Okay, so this is one part of the carbon cycle um, that's buried within the bigger scheme of the carbon cycle that we have gone over to date. So if you go back to um, you know a couple of lessons to where I went over where I showed the ocean and the terrestrial carbon cycles in, in greater detail, this these kinds of things are buried in there and they're buried in there for every element that we have a cycle for, including the nitrogen one that we just that we just went over the f a slide ago. Now let's take it one step further. <coughs> we could look at almost anything else in the ocean that can interact with either hydrogens or carbons and see that they in turn affect the biogeochemistry of those elements. Um, a biggie in the ocean, one of the salts, right, that makes the ocean salty is calcium. If we put calcium and carbonate together we have calcium carbonate. What does calcium carbonate um, make up? It makes up um, shells of many organisms, microscopic ones that we talked about, right, like um, like coccolithophores, right? So some phytoplankton, also some microscopic um, zooplankton, um, uh, like tinnitids and and um, and and some and radiolarians, some of those that we went over. Okay, but if you break, if you increase the acidity, if you release these hydrogen ions, they break apart. So they you they're harder to put together. So the the more acid that we have. The more acidic the ocean becomes, the harder it is to put these two things together and get precipitation in the form of calcium carbonate, right? Because when you dissolve these guys, uh, they take up a hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen ion. So what does this mean? It means that all of the well, let's take a let's let's take it in the next slide. Okay, so if, it dolls, if you can think of it in a much simpler way as acid just dissolves many substances. In the presence of acid, it's very hard to, to make a solid. Um, it's very hard to, and, and that's what things are doing when they're making their shells, is precipitating the calcium carbonate, or calcium and the carbonate in order to make their shells. And that includes corals, that includes all the bivalves, and it includes a lot of the microscopic organisms that do this. So when we look at the carbon cycle, by increasing CO2 in the ocean or in the atmosphere, we're uh, ostensibly increasing the concentration of CO2 in the ocean, which shifts that whole equation we just looked at, which essentially decreases the pH, which is the same as saying increasing the acidity. And every little bit that we do that, we are also affecting the calcium cycle, the biogeochemical cycling of calcium. Um, in terms of precipitation and dissolution. It's, its ability to, to either be a salt ion or a solid calcium carbonate compound in the ocean. And in doing so, we are decreasing the amount of calcium carbonate shell precipitation that can occur in the ocean. And what that does is twofold. It makes it very difficult for new organisms like coral, um, Bi any bivalves, any clams or mussels or anything that precipitates calcium carbonate shells or any of the microbes that do, a lot of the phytoplankton, makes it very difficult for them to make good strong shells, the newly born ones. Um, but it makes also the pre-existing ones, it makes it very difficult for them to to um, <clears throat> to keep their shells, okay? It slowly dissolves their shells. And so this is just looking at how a shift in the carbon cycle can affect one element. Um, so what is the shift in that element besides for shifting shell precipitation? What does the shift in calcium do to other other cycles that it might interact with? And what other what other um, elements, elemental cycles is this affecting besides for calcium? And the answer is very many more. Another one that we're familiar with is the silicon cycle. Very similar processes have to happen um, to the calcium carbonate cycle as they do for silicon in order for organisms to precipitate their shells and make essentially what are glass shells, um, like the diatoms. Anything that makes a, uh, a silicon dioxide shell has a much harder time doing so if we shift the carbon cycle this way, increasing CO2, increasing acidity. And this is just an awful lot of food for thought, and it trickles down and is, and is 
it, it affects many other cycles. Thanks for joining me, guys.